Hi, this is Wes Simpson with another edition of the Summer Sessions on Media Over IT, brought to you by Ames and the VSF. With me today is John Mayett, CTO Networking and Infrastructure from Imagine Communications. And he is going to be talking about the benefits of IP systems for sporting venues. Welcome, John. Hey, thanks, Wes. Really good to be here on what had to be the hottest day of the year yesterday. <laughs> Well, hopefully it'll be a little bit better today. I'm uh, looking forward to your presentation. Let's, uh, let's dive in. Sure. So I, I've had the pleasure of working on SMPTE 2110 now for what seems like my whole life, but really it's only been about seven years. And, you know, interesting, we always think about television and television environments or TV stations, network release centers, but there's a whole set of video applications out there that use professional television equipment, but use it in a way to do other things. And so one of the fun um, applications we see are these professional sporting venues. And we've all been to a Rangers game or a Knicks game, or you know maybe you have other teams you like. Um, and you think about the venue, right? So there's a truck that's hired to do the broadcast. So whoever owns the rights hires the truck, the truck turns up, the truck does the show. And so you don't think twice about the venue. But if you actually spring for tickets and you go sit in the seats, you realize there's a whole production going on inside the venue that has, you know, the big Jumbotron scoreboards. If you've been to say the, uh, you know, MetLife Stadium, you'll see the big scoreboards there. Or if you, you know, watch all the signage out in the food areas, um, well, all that content doesn't exactly come from the truck it comes from an inside production facility that's part of the venue and so the scoreboards and everything come from there they have sometimes their own replay system separate from the replay systems on the truck they definitely have a switcher graphics multi-viewers you know all that stuff like a real facility because it is quite a real facility so they provide some, you know, they have their own specialty cameras. So, you know, you think of like, you know, the KISS cam and things like that, but also some of the built-in cameras of the venue, like the camera that's directly over the net and hockey, things like that, are really part of the facility. And they get to the truck through this inside production facility. Um, now, the inside production also takes signals from the rights holder's truck if there is a rights holder's truck, but they produce a whole specialty thing. And then in the college environment, this inside production facility actually can produce other on-campus content. So it might be built for football, but it's used by everybody for everything. And so that's in particular the issue with colleges that they use this inside production facility to do every sport um they can produce a whole game feed if there's no truck they can drive content of course for all the stuff inside but importantly they are distributed around the whole campus so the production facility might be at say the football stadium but they've got fiber out to field hockey and lacrosse and every sport that you might see on espnu or espnu2 or you know whatever down you know smaller and smaller channels those productions are often done in this inside production facility and college campuses in particular can be quite large and these feel these venues can be really far apart so it's kind of an interesting technology challenge of how do you link them all together and time them and make them act right in a you know switched environment so all that said what makes it interesting is size and it's not so much the size of the system, but it's the size of the facility. These stadiums are really, really large. Um, if you you know, think about something like the, the venue in the middle there, which is a, a football venue, um, it's got an entire football field inside it. And then the stands are built around it. And so if you walked a lap of the thing, you'd be back for lunch. It's a quite a long walk. Um, and often, the venues have a longer lifespan than the technology. So a venue might be built and then have one or two or three generations of technology refresh that goes on inside. So when you're refitting into an existing structure, you know, 
you have to work around a lot of stuff sometimes. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that flexibility is super important. I mean, that venue might have a football field in the middle of it, but I'll tell you, there's not very many football games in a year compared to the number of other events, right? So every night something different's happening when things are happening. Um, and every one of them has different needs, especially with audio. And audio is the big challenge in these inside productions because every event has its own need. Um, of course, then there's the rights holders truck dock and every truck that pulls up wants to operate in a different format. Your venue systems in a different format. So there's lots of format conversions and it all has to get put together between when that truck chocks down and when it's game time, plus everything else that has to happen in there. So getting it up quickly is good. And of course, in the university environment, remember we talked about the size of the campus and how far apart everything is. And then likewise, in these venues, the operations staff, they're freelancers. So it can't take a lot of getting used to, to walk into the facility and be productive. And in the universities, a lot of times it's student operators, especially on the smaller and smaller events. And so they're learning and they're good. And some of these students are fantastic, I'll tell you, but it is definitely part of the challenge that the student operations team is learning how to use it. So everything, even if it's built with IP, it has to look and feel and act like the equipment that these freelancers have used for many years. So why 2110? How does 2110 help you here? Well, the first way 2110 helps you is that everything's on fiber to begin with. So you can fit eight three gig signals in a fiber wavelength at 25 gig, you get 32 and 100 gig. So suddenly you take a single 100 gig connection over market optics to one of these you know, remote parts. You know, maybe you take a single 100 gig or a main and protect pair of them over to the field hockey venue. Well, you can buy SFPs at 100 gig that have 30 kilometers of reach. Okay, 30 kilometers will cover most needs even in a pretty large college campus. Yeah, that'd be pretty big. <laughs> and and so you know oh yeah there's there's colleges where that's I mean by the time you count the real routing it's mm -hmm. you know you can burn through ten kilometers pretty fast sure so but thirty will get you there so the other beauty is that you can mix and match the the optics so you can have a couple SFPs that are the super long reach for getting to those faraway venues and a couple SFPs that are only ten kilometer reach for getting to the other side of the stadium you're in. Um, you know, and then a bunch of AOCs that are just um, sort of direct attach cables for things inside the same room. And you can really cost optimize. And, and believe it or not, there's a lot of cost optimization that goes on in these projects. Um, but equally, you know, these are shows and these are high value shows. And so you have the opportunity to make every piece of this stuff redundant with the 2022-7 hitless merge system. So it's not a failover. It's not a changeover switch that changes over because something failed. Instead, it's a true protection against loss and against errors on every fiber, every SFP, and every switch. And it does take up a lot less space. I'll show you a few pictures in a minute that really drive that point home. Um, but the other key thing is that as venues go to refresh, one of their challenges right now is UHD. And it's not that they necessarily have a UHD requirement, but they have a requirement to be ready to do UHD, to have a strategy to do UHD, and to be able to answer the question about how are we going to do that? What's that going to cost? And, and they live in the expectation that at some point, one of the major rights holders is going to say, hey, let's try UHD next season. So each of the venues is trying to be in their own way ready for that. Um, not to mention things like these giant displays in the venues. You know, UHD might actually look better on those. So the core of these systems is fiber-based. So typically a pair of, you know, um, what we jokingly call small core switches. Um, in this example, it's a pair of four-slot switches. Each slot has about a 32 or 3,600 gig ports. And so these small quote unquote switches get you the equivalent of like a 4k by 4k UHD or eight, you know, three gig SDI router. 
And likewise, you know, the fiber at the other end is equally beautiful because you can go out to like the example I have here is the cameras on the left or the multi viewers on the right, where, you know, it used to be a mountain of coax behind the cameras. But if you look now, you can see on the picture on the left here that that's the back of the CCUs. So what used to be 8 trillion coaxes there, oh, that rack looks pretty empty. And you might be thinking, when are they going to come back and dress the rest of the cables? But that's done. I mean, the power cords aren't hooked up, but that's done. So this is ready, and it's all fiber, and the fiber just makes it smaller. And that's not just about physical space. Think about the number of cables that have been reduced. And every one of those cables had to be labeled and strong and installed and project managed. And so the reducing the number of cables alone reduces the cost of the project. And even on the right, that's a rack of multiviewers. Oh, it looks a little fuller, but each one of those boxes is a 48 pip four display multiviewer. So it really is uh, just a lot less overall volume of cable and number of cables. So that's helped a lot. Now, the other big challenge, benefit, curse, what have you in 2110 is audio. So SDI has 16 channels, they're embedded. You have to disembed every place you touch it, which can be good or bad depending on the nature of your facility. But in a production facility, it's quite painful. Well, in 2110, we kept all the audio separate on separate streams, but all in ethernet. And so the principle is the audio console can subscribe to all the streams at once. Um, in practice, in an IP facility like this, the audio console subscribes to almost all the streams because the A2 there might decide he wants the audio from that camera. He might decide mid-show that he wants it. So they generally set up almost everything available in the matrix in the console, and then they can pick and choose in the audio console. Now, the other reason they do this is flexibility because then you just have an audio guy sits down at the audio console and he's got all his feeds there. And remember every event in these facilities, they might have 250 events a year in one of these big venues. And some of them are home games of their team. Those are the easy ones. Every other event is completely different. If you look at Madison Square Garden, it's got rodeos in it. It's got monster truck pulls in it. Um, oh yeah, and they have Rangers games and Knicks games too. So like every event is its own unique event. And of course the control system has to tie it together. Now there's some curses of 2110 audio as well, right? In 2110, the audio is sent on these separate IP streams, but every device in practice has a different idea of how to organize the audio on those streams. There's devices that are built around the idea of eight channels per stream. There's devices that support one channel per stream. There's a lot of devices that support four channels per stream, which is kind of a funny compromise. How do you mix and match this stuff? Well, there's two kind of approaches people take. One is you try to do everything you can as stereo. You set your router up as stereo. And if you have a few devices that can't deal with stereo, you deal with them as exceptions. Um, another way that seems to work pretty well in these venues is to actually use shuffle controls inside the endpoints that support that but to use the audio console, not just for the audio production, but also as a shuffler for these devices that don't support internal shuffling. And so that way, you know, when you size the matrix on the audio console, it turns out that if you get a matrix that takes in, say, a, you know, 200 or 300 streams, it also has the ability to make 200 or 300 streams. They tend to sell that in a pair. Well, you don't, you know, you don't always need all those outputs, but you can use them to solve this other part of the puzzle. And again, the control system is what ties it all together, makes it act like a television facility, so that when freelancers or student operators come in and do their show, they don't perceive it as some, you know, new project. They just perceive it as, oh, an audio console. I'll mix the show. Um, so that's the beauty. Now, the other beautiful thing in 2110 is timing. And the timing is nice because, again, we talked about all these venues and parts of venues and distributing everything and fiber every place. Well, if we were doing traditional black burst, you'd be having a whole other set of fibers to get black burst over to all those places. Oh, and word clock and DARS and all those other things you might need. But because the timing is on the same IP network with the media, it just gets there. 
So every place you're getting video and audio and ants data from and to, you're sending timing from and to it all on the same fibers. So you don't have to build out all that stuff. It just takes like, you know, rack units and rack units of equipment out of the project. Now, the other beautiful thing is that we talked about UHD and sometimes three gig and HD and so forth. PTP doesn't care. PTP is the same, regardless of what format of video you're producing. So you don't have to be worrying about tri-level and which tri-level, and I've got to make different tri-level if I'm doing 24 or 2398 or whatever might happen. It's one timing format that works for everything. So that alone is worth the cost of doing PTP. But then the fact that it rides on the same infrastructure with the video is even better. Now, the other thing that really is helpful in these projects is just the simplification factor. And by that, I mean that if you used a bespoke technology, you'd be stuck in maybe a single vendor ecosystem. But in 2110, you get choices because there's 60 or 70 vendors. You know, there's, if you went to the IP showcase at the last, you know, mm -hmm. IPC, there was a big rack of stuff and there was 50, 60 vendors of 2110 equipment. And, you know, we've used, we've worked with a lot of our, you know, fellow vendors in lots of projects and by and large 2110 works and works interoperably. So just like with STI as a customer, you can choose the cameras and switchers and replays and multi viewers and all the other equipment based on operational considerations and not be constraining the creative team and their operational choices with some issues about technical limitations of, well, I can't mix that camera with this thing because they, they don't speak the same language. Um, so this is super important because 2110 provides that level playing field for best of breed systems. And that's what drives choice in the television industry and ultimately drives the whole economics. Now, here's a couple examples. So here's a basketball arena that we did recently. Um, this one had grass cameras and a Ross switcher, um, had Imagine multiviewers, had the EBS replay system, all tied together with 2110. Uh, we used the Tech PTP, um, had Tech Prism. That's the one common thing you'll see in all these projects is you need a piece of test equipment. And the Prism is pretty nice for driving that you know, single thing. Um, basketball arena, you know, straightforward. This project's been, you know, up and running. It, it did a whole season before this season got slid out. Um, the next one I think is the football arena. Yep. And here it's a little different because we had the Ebert's replay and the grass cameras, and this one had a grass switcher. Um, again, you know, tech PTP, um, Aristocore, and of course our RSNPs doing a lot of the, you know, format conversions and UHD conversions and all that. So again, a straightforward project, but you'll see, you know, this mix of equipment is what makes the customer happy and the creative team happy because they picked the cameras they wanted, the switcher they wanted, the replay they wanted, got everything together in one project. The third project, the same way, it's a different smattering of things. This one had Sony cameras and the Ebert's replay, but the Ross switcher. So, you know, it's, 2110 lets you put this stuff together and it works fine. It's been a good, good example. Now, the other thing that's fascinating about these three projects is that they were done by three different integrators. And so that too is an interesting statement about you can put together these systems and it doesn't take, you know, it takes special knowledge, obviously, on the part of the integrator to organize and deliver the project, but it can be done reasonably. Um, so What's the deal? 2110 has the scalability to do whatever you got to do. Um, it has this economy of space and cabling that, especially when you're working into a legacy facility, getting that space back and needing fewer cables and needing fewer core drills in a legacy facility is really helpful. Um, the audio flexibility is there, right? That's gives you very good audio flexibility. And of course, the timing and the systemization, especially the being able to, you know, build a system that has the choices of vendors and the choices of partners is, I think, what the industry has wanted all along in this IP transition. So there we go. That's 2110 for sporting venues. Well, uh, thank you, John. Um, I appreciate the, um, 
the, the your insights here. So um, first question. So all of these um, uh, events that you were talking about are, uh, or all these venues are things that are actually installed and uh, running today. Um, yeah, the they did. You know, they were installed. Actually, the, those three venues were installed before. You know, they they each have a real season under their belt, mm -hmm. plus whatever would have happened this year. But you know, there's been a bit of a pause. Sure, sure, under, understandably. So, so we, when you guys were constructing those systems, um, what were the the biggest challenges? What what were the what were the hurdles that you had to overcome that might be uh, interesting to the audience? Um, I, I think, you know, there were there were a variety of small small issues, but overall, we get through small issues pretty quickly as an industry now because through these associations like Ames, we've developed a uh, Kind of a first name basis relationship among the engineering leaders at these different companies so mm. we're able to get to the bottom of issues much more quickly than used to happen because at least we kind of know each other know each other's email addresses we can kind of get things sorted out um i'd say the challenges mostly have been around audio and getting to the bottom of how do different devices actually want to do audio and then making the system work the way the devices expect. Um, that's been, I'd say, the, the biggest challenge in each design is sort of finding the path of how's audio going to work in this facility. Now, by the time it's done, by the time the operator sits down at the sound desk and is just mixing the show, it's just a show. They, the, mm -hmm. you know, but getting the system to work so that a, you know, freelance audio operator can sit down at the console and actually mix the show with maybe, you know, a couple hours of pre-show to learn where things are. That's, that's the hard part is making the project not look like an IP project, but just look like, eh, it's a sound desk. It's a, what are we doing tonight? A, a you know, a rodeo. Okay. Where's the announcer mic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I hear that a lot. Uh, no pun intended. Um, but yeah, audio certainly is, is a real challenge. So um, one of the other things that's interesting about a lot of these venues um, more and more are these, you know, enormous video screens up at the, uh, the top of the stadium or distributed at various places along the uh, perimeter. And uh, those are definitely not traditional uh, video formats. Are, are those things that you see going into um, um, ST2110 or, you know, how is that going to evolve? Um it's interesting because uh, you're right, those displays, especially the ribbon, the ribbon is, yeah. you know, a couple hundred pixels high and super wide. And so you'd think, oh, you know, 2110 could, you know, represent that because mm -hmm. you can have a picture in 2110 that's, you know, 200 pixels high and 10,000 pixels wide and send it around. And so we assumed in the standards process that that might be helpful. Um, so far, you know, remember that these, you know, display systems were developed over the years to interface back to traditional television equipment sure. for their graphics and things. So, um, so far, the interfacing I've seen is that they still take in signals using 1920 by 1080 rasters. Oh, okay. But over time, you know, that'll change as soon as there's an operational benefit. So as soon as there's some trick they can do or some feature they can get that comes from interfacing at IP at their actual resolution, then I think we'll see, you know, see a, a, a change there. But it's always, you know, change is driven by feature. So if there's some feature that a production needs or a venue needs that could be supported by that, great, that'll probably drive it to happen. Um, the, the displays, the giant displays are also very interesting size and shape and they too, you know, for the most part are HD resolution, at least at the, or, you know, 1080p resolution mm -hmm. at, the, at the input to the processor. And then the processor turns it into whatever the display wants. And that includes massaging the transfer characteristic, right? Because that's certainly not the transfer characteristics of, you know, simply phosphors. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. So, so you know, you, you've been heavily involved. You know, the the author of, of a lot of the, um, or the, the you know the, the primary writer of of the um, SMPTE uh, 2110 specifications. Do, are there any changes that you think need to be made to those specs 
um, to make things better for you know non-traditional broadcasting systems you know the, all the venue work you're talking about the the colleges you know uh, whatever are, are there and I know there's the IPMX thing going on we've covered that earlier in the series but are there any is there anything that's that needs to be massaged in in um, the SMPTE specs as they stand to, to really make it better for these other venues um you know, we're really trying hard to not make changes because there's sure. you know, like I said, 50, 60, 70, 80 vendors now have built equipment. Um, what we are doing, and we are, you know, in SEMPTE in the process of the one year reviews and maybe several year reviews of these documents. Um, as we've found nits and as we found little issues when we try to integrate between vendors, I think we've done a pretty good job as an organization of coming back and saying, okay, could the standard have been more clear? Could mm -hmm. we have worded this differently so that everybody kind of saw it the same way? And so we are doing a lot of that. We are doing a lot of don't I know you know, it. minor text <laughs> issue, you know, minor text fixing just to make the document really clear. Um, but on the whole, on the whole, we're not making wholesale changes to anything because at this point, there's a lot of built systems, there's a lot of designed equipment, there's an active marketplace of equipment, and nothing will goof that up worse than uncertainty. So mm -hmm. it's really, you know, our goal is to make the standards, if anything, simpler, more concise, say what they're trying to say in the right number of words, which is sometimes more and sometimes less, and to really remove the ability to um, interpret things funny. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well that that's that's an admirable goal. So there really, I mean, other you know, other than the compressed video things that we're working on and some of the uh, the metadata things, um, there isn't a lot of new stuff coming out in twenty one ten at least in the next uh, year or so. Right. So, the the new work is all add ons. It's yeah. the uh, I mean the compressed work has been done from a twenty one ten perspective for a while. It's not you know, it's still catching on in an industry sense, but mm -hmm. it's, I don't, you know, we don't know of any new standards work that's needed there versus just the, you know, a lot of finishing work. Yeah. The, uh, um, the metadata stuff that's starting up now is, you know, is a good add on and it'll enable some new things in the future. Um, kind of, you know, getting away from SMPTE, um, 291 ANTS data and having a more mm -hmm. native format for, data that frankly never existed in ANS data. Um, but I think that's that's a nice layer in. It's not a uh, it's not by itself going to drive some new change. It's going to enable a couple of applications, mm -hmm. particularly in the audio area. There's a tremendous amount of innovation going on right now in the audio world around object-based audio and sort of, you know, um, how audio three-dimensional representation gets done in a way that you can correctly mix for every different you know, view angle and view environment and so forth. And so that audio, as you can imagine, has a lot of metadata that goes mm -hmm. with it and how you shepherd that around the production plan. That's, that is interesting new work. Absolutely. Well, well, John, thank you so much for your time today. I uh, really appreciate your, um, your insights here. And uh, it's always nice to talk about systems that, you know, really exist in the real world instead of just, you know, proposed standards that we hope are going to be absorbed. I mean, from what I've seen, you know, th this this really provided a lot of benefits for your customers and um, it works. You know, it, it, it's uh, it survived the uh, the rigors of a of a couple of sports seasons. So that that's really interesting to know. Yeah, no, it's, it's been a great experience to work on this and I, I look forward to seeing it be the basis of design as new facilities are built all over the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. So do you think it's going to cool off a little bit now? Hard to say. I, I poked my head out this morning and it was already 80 degrees at 8.30 this morning. Yeah, yeah, we're not, we're not built for that here in uh, New Jersey and Connecticut. It's just not, uh, not our thing. I, when I was a kid, I grew up in Connecticut. Uh, we didn't have, we never had air conditioning, you know. Uh, just a fan, that was about it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania. Same thing. It was, you know, it, we, we prepped for snow, but we didn't prep for